<sighs> Phase four is over. And I know what you're thinking. Wait, that's the end? No Avengers movies? No team up? No shared themes or world building objectives? This wasn't a real phase. Marvel just needed to pick a movie to be the end and Wakanda Forever or the Guardians Holiday Special just happened to be that one, right? Wrong. You could not be more incorrect. Of course Marvel Phase 4 had a cohesive theme. In fact, it was the most thematically consistent phase since Phase 1. And if you don't know why, whew, buckle up because I'm about to explain the very clear and obvious themes of Phase 4 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Starting with... Hey, Kevin Feige, just wanted to add a little note here. Don't worry, I'm going to cut this out for the final video. I just wanted to ask because if I was talking to somebody about Phase 4, and they brought up all the things you just had me say in that scripted part called, um, Attack Straw Man. Like, if they said they did not think this phase had a theme, and it's just a bunch of movies and shows, I would say I think they're right. I mean, it can't have that much of a theme. There's so much that needed to be changed. So many projects were shuffled around in the order, and then they needed to be rewritten. I mean, hell, this was the COVID phase. And some things that were originally going to be in Phase 4 didn't make it in, so, you know, it can't be that cohesive of a phase. Now... Don't worry, I'm going to figure something out. I will watch all the movies and I will watch all the shows and I'll pull out some clever themes that'll get this video on some Screen Rant article called something like, I don't know, Phase 4 is a hidden gem or whatever. So I can't come up with something. I just want to say, I think the phase is just a bunch of movies and shows. Also, I haven't heard anything about my Great Lake Avenger script yet. I'm sure it's coming. Anyway, back to the video. So let's start with the first thing I think can be used to learn about Phase 4. Action figures. So if we go chronologically, the first action figure we see is John Walker's action figures at his announcement event. Astute comic readers knew where John was going from the beginning, but this was the first sign that things were a bit off. After Sam hands the shield off to the government to be part of the Captain America exhibit, they immediately give it to John Walker, a seemingly well-meaning soldier who was more of what people expected from a Captain America, which is a fancy way of saying he was white. And he was embraced in a way that we had not seen before, or at least in a while. The government trotted him out with a big event at his old high school, the marching band was there, adoring fans, and a news crew ready to record an interview for a morning talk show. This was premeditated. The government had been waiting for the exact moment Sam relinquished the shield to introduce Steve 2.0. They had a candidate picked, a costume ready, a band, flyers, and even action figures. When John approaches the interview, he takes a second to sign some flyers and an action figure. I even have that figure. Here. It's not the exact same one, but the box is the same. Man, but I would really want to get Wyatt Russell to sign it. It would be very cool. If you know him and he wants to... I don't know, come to my house for this? I don't know how this would work, but it would be cool. The world's introduction to John Walker is a lot like the world's introduction to Steve Rogers. Both were introduced with big, showy events designed to inspire confidence in America and, if the opportunity presents itself, to sell some stuff. The big difference is when Steve was doing his USO tour, he was uncomfortable. He was not a showman, an entertainer. Steve was just a good guy doing what he thought he needed to do to raise some money. John was different. He was good at this. And not in a bad way, either. He wasn't getting a cut off the back end of the action figure sales that we know of. He was genuinely out here to do good, fight bad guys, save innocents, give people hope, honor his heroes, send sign some autographs, smile, wave, whatever it takes. John was not a bad guy, but this contrast showed that he was the wrong guy. Too comfortable, too confident, too perfect. And when things start this perfectly, the inevitable failure hits harder. In John's case, he went off the deep end, killed a surrendering soldier, got fired, joined Val, and then was not in episode 6. I don't think. Let's not check. But the action figure here is a bad omen. This is too perfect, too controlled. It cannot last, and it cannot exist in a vacuum. This figure and this production proves that the government was waiting for this moment where they could take the shield from Sam and give it to someone who looked a bit more familiar. Black Widow has a similar moment to Falcon and the Winter Soldier, this time starring the Red Guardian. His rescue from the Gulag by Natasha and Yelena is instigated by the delivery of an old Red Guardian action figure. One I tried and tried and tried to find but could not. It's larger than your average Hasbro Legends figure, probably around as big as one of those Barbie-sized figures they sell at Target, but to my knowledge, 
Strange, they never made one like that of Red Guardian. Alexi takes his action figure, the head pops off revealing an earpiece, and Alexi is able to use it to communicate with the girls and escape. The action figure is the first and only reference we see to Red Guardian outside of his costume itself. We never see posters for this Russian Captain America who was presumably active sometime in the 1980s. He tells stories about the Red Guardian to his fellow prisoners, including one who says he is Ursa Major, but he didn't get a da -na 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 -na. so who knows if it's just a code name or he can actually turn into a bear. When Alexi is given the Red Guardian figure, he's mocked by the guards. People seem to know that he was the Red Guardian, but nobody cares. This action figure is a relic of a bygone era, when the Soviet Union was competing with the US for apparently superpower supremacy, and Alexi looking at the figure is reminded of that time. He presses the star on the chest that lights up and plays a sound, and then Alexi pulls the string that plays what I assume was his catchphrase, Red Guardian forward, the trumpet is calling. The figure serves to show the audience how far Alexi has fallen. He was a hero who rivaled our Avengers, but the USSR collapsed and Alexi was buried underneath it. We learn the figure was sent by Natasha and Yelena, so it also shows that they remember who he used to be, and one of them kept that toy, perhaps so they could reminisce about the good old days. Spider-Man No Way Home is less of a toy and more merchandise, but when Peter's identity is revealed to the world, everything is thrown into chaos. He's being sued, he's flanked by fans and haters everywhere he goes. We get a look at some of them outside his school, but we also see some of them inside. Peter is greeted by the three teachers we've met so far. I don't know their names, so let's just call them Martin Starr, Hannibal Burris, and J.B. Smoove. The three welcome Peter back to school and awkwardly present him with an awards cabinet filled with fan art made by his fellow students, or maybe Martin Starr. While there are not any action figures, there is a Minecraft style Spider-Man figure and a fake mask. And this moment is awkward for Peter. He does not want to be worshipped by his teachers or his peers. He wants a normal life. For this third time, the action figures were bad. Moon Knight also very briefly featured an action figure. At the end of episode 4, after Mark is presumably killed, he wakes up in an asylum populated by the Moon Knight supporting cast. We'll eventually learn that this was, uh, I don't know, was this part of the afterlife? What about that fake office with Harrow? Like, we know he was in the afterlife, but then why was the Harrow stuff happening? That show got away from him in the end. Anyway, on the floor, Mark finds a toy. It's a homemade version of a Moon Knight, seemingly made from a basic white figure, some clay for the hood, and some fabric for the cape. Mark picks it up and wonders if any of this was real. Was Stephen Grant just a character in an Indiana Jones-style adventure serial? Is Harrow just his therapist? We don't get any more time with the toy here, but again, the figure is a dark mirror of Mark. An effigy of a persona that for that moment is a delusion that has destroyed Mark's sanity. The last big action figure moment comes in Miss Marvel, and it's the only one that's anything near positive. Kamala's room is filled with posters of Captain Marvel. She does fan videos online, which are very good and not getting as many views as they deserve, and she visits something called Avengers Con, where she's able to pose with Avengers props and buy toys. We see a figure of Scott Lang on display at the event, and at no point over the course of the series is Kamala's perception of the Avengers proven wrong. This is not a never meet your heroes kind of story, so Kamala is the stand-in for your average MCU super fan. And the action figures are just action figures that you should go to your local Target and buy. There are some other instances of things resembling toys or figures that don't quite fit in this category, but I do want to mention. I can't imagine New Asgard is not selling some toy of Thor. I mean, they have that very strange Snap-themed ice cream shop, so I think Thor toys are happening. In Hawkeye, Clint goes to the Captain America musical Rogers, which no doubt sells toys. He also sits a few rows in front of a kid wearing a Black Widow Halloween costume. In WandaVision, the drone is transformed into a toy helicopter by the Hex, which could symbolize an infantilization inherent in the MCU. Serious things go in and are turned into toys for emotionally stunted man-children, I don't know, that seems like what Bill Maher would say. The Drip Broker's doorman was selling knockoff Avengers merchandise in She-Hulk. And finally, Doctor Strange mentions Avengers lunchboxes to Wanda when he attempts to get her to help save America Chavez. I'm surprised we never saw any action figures in Loki, one of the more meta shows in Phase 4, but overall, the action figures signaled two things. First, that the MCU, as it exists in our world, an entertainment juggernaut, also exists in the MCU in kind of the same way. Enough time has passed that people in the MCU have become emotionally detached from events like the Battle of New York 
or The Snap, and they've turned them into fun musicals and ice cream mascots. And then in reaction to that, the characters see themselves as increasingly less real, sneering at the action figures that represent them, confused about how this world views them. Is Hawkeye a soldier or a cartoon character? And how does the MCU move forward when its characters have both saved all reality and become pop culture icons? But it wasn't just toys. Phase 4 was also about metaphysical crises. Who are we? What is real? Are we real? Who is in control? There's only one way to deal with that. A funky metaphysical crisis. We talked about how some of the characters in the MCU are upset by how they've become pop culture figures, but then how do they deal with that? How do they define their reality? There were more than a couple moments in Phase 4 when characters stepped off the usual path of their journey into Cuckoo Bananas Land nonsense. For example, WandaVision is all this. After the death of the Vision, Wanda breaks down and creates a new reality, one where the Vision is alive and the two of them have twins and her brother is alive and everything is Malcolm in the middle. Only for that reality to be exposed as fabricated and Wanda to, for two additional times, watch her husband die and now her children. Loki really falls headfirst into this idea by episode 5. He spends time hanging out with the other Lokis and learning that he's not so alone in the universe after all, before sitting down with the architect of reality who reads him the script for the episode. Some of the metaphysical crises are a bit more subtle. Mark's crisis is self-contained. He's asking who he is and which parts of himself are real. He spent his entire life living half of a lie. So in episodes 4 and 5, Mark finds himself trapped in the Asylum flashbacks after life zone and learns what Steven really is and why Mark created him. Miss Marvel is having an equally strange season leading up to episode 5, which is the time travel episode. Kamala doesn't understand who she is, where she comes from, and it's not until she is able to travel to the past that she learns exactly what she is and what she needs to stand for. Falcon and the Winter Soldier, uh, Hawkeye. Uh, listen, they're not all super metaphysical. Some are just about some Avengers making friends and getting new costumes, and that's fine. But what if? Well, what if you want metaphysical crisis? The Watcher, the being who has seen all that can and will be from infinite realities, has a crisis of his own. Should he interfere? What is his purpose if he does more than watch? A character we have known for all 10 minutes is having his own metaphysical crisis in the form of a Dragon Ball Z fight. And of course, She-Hulk was also one big metaphysical crisis. Jen learned that she was part of a TV show and spoke to the computer that keeps ignoring my calls. I mean, writing the MCU. She used the conversation to fundamentally alter her own reality, adding and removed certain characters, refocused the season with some new things. That kind of thing could never happen in Phase 2. This is Phase 4. You may be wondering, what does metaphysics mean and how can one have a metaphysical crisis? Well, metaphysics is a broad branch of philosophy that deals with questions about life, the universe, and the nature of everything. It examines questions like, what's the meaning of life? Does a soul exist? Do we have free will? Does God exist? What is the universe? Do I exist? And does that existence matter? The best example of a Phase 4 project that tackles these themes is the Eternals. In that movie, one of the Eternals talks to her space god creator and learns that the Earth is just a big egg for another space god and the Eternals and Deviants are robots made to keep the Earth going until the egg cracks. And this is going on all over the universe. Wait a second, if the Deviants are a mistake and the Eternals exist to correct that mistake, why do the Celestials keep making Deviants? the same way on other planets. Huh? Man, Eternals really got away from him in the end. In Doctor Strange, Strange and America travel to different realities and meet different Doctor Strange. Strange contemplates his place in the universe. Is he destined to destroy it? Is Doctor Strange the greatest threat to the multiverse? And what is the multiverse? We learn that there are infinite universes with infinite versions of everyone and everything. And this concept is used to demonstrate to Strange how differently his life could have ended up. If left to his own devices, he is almost always destined to destroy destroy everything. Does our Doctor Strange have free will, and can he change his fate? Over in Spider-Man Corner, Peter learns that there are infinite realities and infinite versions of Spider-Man that all have their own problems and villains, and those villains almost all come to our reality and destroy it. Facing death, physicist Jane Foster travels to the omnipotent city and meets Zeus, then to the cosmic entity Eternity before dying and going to Valhalla. Even Black Panther, one of the more grounded franchises, has a character go to the spirit world and meet with a vengeful cousin who tells them to kill Namor. But what's the purpose? Well, Phase 4 needed to stretch the definition of reality. 
drastically re-examine everything we know about the MCU so we can fit everything else inside. Spider-Man, Deadpool, X-Men, versions of characters we always wanted to see but never thought we would be able to, and rebooted versions of characters that actually, you know, you can't be rebooted because they never made an Inhumans show. They filmed all the episodes and they put it in a warehouse and the warehouse burned to the ground, so, you know, they, it never happened, sure. Kevin Feige could have come on screen at the beginning of Secret Wars and said, hey, by the way, there's a multiverse and it means Hugh Jackman is Wolverine, Toby is also Spider-Man, also so is Andrew Garfield, everything but Fan 4 Stick is in play. But the more interesting way to give us this information is to let the characters learn it too and force them to wrestle with what that all means. What is their place in the universe? Are they real? Are they unique? Okay, so those are some big concepts. Let's get a little bit smaller, about like this big, big enough to go on your wrist. Phase four was the wristlet phase. And I use the word wristlet because I mean a thing worn around your wrist, not a little clutch that is attached to your wrist because apparently the word wristlet means a little bit more than that. Originally, I wanted to call it the jewelry phase, but I decided I wanted to zero in on the wrist. Although, real quick, some significant jewelry. Gore rejects his god by tearing off his religious necklace. The bloodstone is a magical amulet which gives its user eternal life and the ability to harm monsters. It is traditionally worn on a necklace. Dama, the matriarchal figure in Falcon and the Winter Soldier, wears a Hamsa necklace, which we learn is the inspiration for the Flag Smasher's insignia. Shang-Chi and his sister Zhai Ling each wear a pendant that Wu needs to learn the location of Tao Lo. And there's probably some version of this in Moon Knight. Is it the Scarab something, or the necklace Lila wears for a little bit? I don't know. But the important things are mostly bracelets. Sometimes they're magical, sometimes they're just sentimental, but either way, many Phase 4 projects have something significant around the character's wrists. Let's start with WandaVision. Second episode features a commercial for a watch. It was originally going to be one of the magical signals sent by Doctor Strange to Wanda, but it ended up being nothing, I guess maybe her like subconscious? It was unclear, I don't think we ever really got an answer there. Speaking of Doctor Strange, besides the magical handcuffs he wears during the Illuminati scene, at the end of Multiverse of Madness, Strange repairs the wristwatch that Christine got him, which was damaged in Strange's famous car crash. Speaking of watches, He Who Remains wears a magical watch time dial thing on the back of his hand. He uses it to control the flow of time, and it is currently owned by Sylvie. Hawkeye is also after a watch that reveals the identity of a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent who we will eventually learn is his wife. Then you've got magical stuff. When Spider-Man needs to trap the escaped villains he is given by Strange, a new wrist gauntlet that can send the villains into special cells. When Shuri visits Talo Khan, she is given a bracelet by Namor, made of the Talo Khani tree that bonded with the heart-shaped herb and gave them their superpowers. Shuri uses this bracelet to synthesize her own version of the heart-shaped herb. When the Eternals need to figure out a way to pool their power, Fastos creates the Unimind, which is manifested in a bracelet worn by every Eternal. And obviously Shang-Chi and Miss Marvel are both empowered by magical wrist-worn artifacts. Do I think this is that significant? Kind of, because all the watches symbolize time and specifically a connection to a character's past. Hawkeye has a secret in the past. Strange wants closure on his relationship with Christine from the past. Wanda wants to return to a simpler time and Kang wants to control time and bring it all to a state before the Kangs ruined it all. And all the magical bracelets symbolize a connection. Sometimes it's a connection to each other, sometimes it's to another civilization, and sometimes it's an ancestor or relative, either way. Wearing the magic bracelet means you are embracing the culture and legacy that those bracelets represent. Spider-Man's one is probably just to sell toys. But yeah, it's a little too interesting to ignore. So far we've been talking a lot about concepts and objects, but what about the people? Have there been any unusual character types we've run into a lot in Phase 4? Well yeah, the dads. They're good. And to examine this, I'm going to make a little tier list. So let's start with the Vision. Perfect example. Vision is a great dad. Sure, in the end, he ends up destroying his own fake children, but saving a bunch of real ones, and it's only because of his relentless pursuit of the truth that the world and all of its children are not consumed by the hex. So, you know, Vision supports Wanda when she's pregnant, he raises the twins, and he teaches them right from wrong, fights to protect them. Vision is one of the best dads in the MCU, S tier. Next MCU thing is Falcon and the Winter Soldier and not a ton of dads here. Isaiah is somebody's dad but we never meet his actual kid and this is not the granddad list that will come in phase I don't know 18 probably and if you don't think we're getting a phase 18 we are and it's in like five years so. 
buckle up. We also get a little bit of Zemo in that season, but he's not really a dad in it. Doesn't really come up much outside of him going to that Sokovia monument. So, you know, he does give kids candy, though. I'm going to say C tier dad. Loki, also sort of dadless. No Odin. So moving on. Black Widow. Now we have a dad. The Red Guardian. He's OK. You know, on one hand, he does seem to care about the girls. And by the end of the story, they are, you know, like a family. On the other hand, he's a Russian deep cover agent who surrenders two children to the Red Room to be tortured and brainwashed. That's some pretty bad dadding. Now, he is redeemed at the end of the movie and he will have more time to shine in Thunderbolts, but I don't think I could put him above like a C tier. You also have Drakov in that movie, a classic MCU bad dad, F tier. And then we had What If, uh, episode 2 had Good Dad Yondu and Good Dad Thanos. B tier, then episode three had Crazy Dad Pim, D tier, but otherwise not a ton of dads. Shang-Chi gives us the most complicated dad in phase four. So Wen Wu is a warlord who raised his son to be a living weapon and then attempts to kill that son. Not great. On the other hand, before his wife died, Wen Wu was a good dad. He played DDR, got his family groceries. What more can you want? Sure, after his wife died, Wen Wu came to the conclusion that the only way to protect his family was to turn Shang into a living weapon and mercilessly train Shang, but Wen Wu did genuinely believe this was the best way to keep Shang and Jialing safe. He's an ancient warlord. This could have been way worse. Should he have gotten some therapy? Absolutely. But, you know, it's so difficult to find a good therapist when you live at the top of a big mountain, especially when he takes your insurance. So, you know, who has the time? Also, we learned Wen Wu could have snatched up the kids whenever he wanted, but until he started hearing the mom's voice again, Wen Wu was fine leaving Shang and Jialing alone, giving them space to grow up. On top of that, most of Wen Wu's actions in the back half of the movie could be chalked up to the Dweller in Darkness's mind manipulation. And in the end, when he realizes he was wrong, Wen Wu sacrifices himself to save Shang. So all in all, a complicated and imperfect dad but definitely not a bad dad. I'm gonna say B tier. Then I guess really only one eternal dad. I mean, there's two dads in the movie, but only one of them is an eternal. That's Fastos and you know, very good dad. Wants to keep his son safe. Seems to have created a safe and loving home with his husband, Ben. And he's Marvel's only first openly gay character to actually be a gay character. And not just a character who says a line of dialogue about their same sex partner, which can easily be scrubbed from the movie if Saudi Arabia gets mad or something. So Fastos and Ben are A tier. Next, Hawkeye. Plenty of dads. First, you got Clint himself trying as hard as he can to protect his family and picking up a surrogate daughter on the way. Say what you will about his character or his app or his midlife crisis band, but Hawkeye has always been an A tier dad. Then there's Armand Sr., Jerk, D tier. However, he is right about the mom being up to something, so you know, let's see C tier. Jack is sort of a stepfather to Kate, a solid dad, nice, goofy, trying to fit in, doesn't get angry when Kate tries to murder him, B tier. And then finally, there's Maya's dad, William, uh, in a difficult spot, you know, tried to give Maya a good life, but was driven to a life of crime, seemingly decent person otherwise, C tier. And Kingpin is more of an uncle, so I'm not counting him. Next, Spider-Man No Way Home. Happy, fine surrogate father to Peter, B tier. Norman Osborn, not that bad of a dad. You know, he's concerned about losing Harry. He breaks the mask. He says the scientist line from internet. Obviously, in the movie, he's a way worse dad, like in Spider-Man 1. But in this movie, he's a decent dad. I'm going to say B tier. Obviously, this changes when he goes goblin, but base Norman is a good dad. Sandman, also a good dad, still loves his daughter. That's still his only character trait, B tier. Then we've got Moon Knight, only one dad of note here, Mark's father, not the worst member of that family, but he does let his son get abused. So bad dad, F tier. Doctor Strange, hey, look who it is, Mr. Fantastic. He's a good dad. You know, he's spaghetti, but he's a good dad. We also have one of the all time bad comic dads in this movie in Professor X, but we don't see either of his sons, so I'm not counting Charles here. Also. Wanda's actions in the movie prove how great Vision was. He disappears and she starts spaghettiing Jack Ryan's left and right. Double good dad for Vision. I'm inventing a new tier. We're going to call it V tier and Vision goes there. Now listen, the Miss Marvel dad is one of the best dads in the MCU. The character. He is great. He is supportive. Green. Gives Kamala her name. Eats fruit pies. So the character. Great. V tier. 
And if you're like, why is he doing this? Just, you know, Google it. Thor Love and Thunder, we got three dads here. First, Gore, like Wen Wu, is complicated, tried as hard as he could to take care of his daughter during their drought, and then she died, the sword made him evil, and when it was destroyed, he wished her back to life. Decent dad, I'm gonna say B tier. Then you got Zeus. Gets killed and then just kidding, wonderful skirt, really into orgies, not sure what's going on with that accent. Not a great dad, I'm gonna say D tier. And finally, Thor. Surprise dad, but good dad. Takes care of love, makes pancakes. I'm gonna say B tier. We'll see if he ends up in A tier in the future. She-Hulk, couple of dads in this one. Jen's dad is great, supportive, caring, ready to bury bodies, A tier dad. Then there's Mr. Immortal, bad dad, D tier. And then you got Hulk. Didn't seem to know that Scar existed, but he's taken responsibility now. Just like Thor, he is a good dad. I'm going to give him a B tier and we'll see what happens in the future. The penultimate dad on this tier list comes from Werewolf by Night. You've got Ulysses Bloodstone. We don't see too much of his dadding, but we see the result of his dadding and it doesn't seem like he was very good. He didn't like actively try to kill his daughter as far as we know. So I'm going to say a D tier dad for Ulysses Bloodstone. Last one is Wakanda Forever. Now it's so recent that I don't want to get into specifics, so I will just say, fine, although confusing dad, uh, B tier. Look at that. This is, we've turned over a new leaf in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The dads are good now. That's fantastic. Now, while I was setting this up, like lights and camera and stuff, and I was thinking about other ways to connect some of the phase four properties and I had a thought, something I'm working through now, but I need to transition, so this is going to be it. And it's a question. There's a lot of cops in Phase 4. Is, um, is Phase 4 the cop phase? So I wanted to cover this here because it's a late addition, but it's a little too interesting to ignore. I was thinking again about the jewelry, and I realized I couldn't figure out anything for She-Hulk. And I thought, hmm, is there something I missed? And I really dug deep to find a single piece of something Jen wears on her wrist. And eventually, I came up with one thing that I didn't love. Jen and Blonsky both wear ankle monitors when they're barred from transforming into their Hulk forms. But I thought, eh, that's not that important. Besides a couple of characters getting arrested from Phase 4 that I haven't included. And I started making a list. And I realized a lot of characters get arrested during Phase 4. And it made me wonder, is Phase 4 the cop phase? So I went through everything in Phase 4, here's what I found. Natasha spends all of Black Widow on the run from the US military. Alexei has been imprisoned in a gulag. And this, the original first project in Phase 4, was also supposed to be our first introduction to Val, the new head of the CIA. I don't think there were any cops in Shang-Chi. Shang is arrested by Wenwu's henchmen, but they're not what I'd call police. Icarus is sort of a cop. He follows orders and attempts to stop and arrest the other Eternals. Also, Arishim, the Eternal they all work for, is the judge. Like, that is his title and his whole purpose is to judge. But then, Peter Parker gets arrested and questioned by damage control. He spends the back half of the movie on the run after J. Jonah Jameson exposes that he has been working with the villains. Doctor Strange is drugged and arrested by the Illuminati. He's even put in a special cell and given special magical handcuffs. Thor gets ensnared by Zeus's magic after attempting to interrupt Zeus's speech. And finally in the movies, Everett Ross is detained by Valentina and the CIA after it is discovered that he's been working with the Wakandans. Over on the shows, originally it seemed like the cop, Jimmy Wu, is a good guy. But then Hayward brings his own cops who arrest Jimmy, Monica, and Darcy. Sam and Bucky are also arrested after casually walking through Isaiah's neighborhood, and John Walker is basically a cop. In his series, Loki is immediately arrested and imprisoned by the TVA. He then goes through a kangaroo court and is forced to work for the TVA. He escapes and is arrested again, and this time he is tortured by the TVA. Clint and Natasha get arrested after it's suspected that they killed the Avengers. In Hawkeye, Kate is picked up by her campus security after destroying a bell tower. In Moon Knight, Steven is detained by Harrow's men posing as police officers. Later, Mark is imprisoned in his mind asylum by Harrow. Kamala is pursued by damage control throughout her series, culminating in a showdown at her high school between Kamala, Cameron, and the damage control agents. The local police show up and are originally on Kamala's side, but they immediately acquiesce to the agents. Jennifer is imprisoned after her fight with the intelligentsia and released under the condition that she never transforms
comes into She-Hulk again. And then in the specials, Jack and Elsa are imprisoned by the Bloodstone guards after it's revealed that they helped Man-Thing escape. And in the holiday special, Drax and Mantis are pursued by police after they attempt to kidnap Kevin Bacon. So first question, is this unusual? After all, our heroes get arrested a lot. Cap and friends get arrested in Winter Soldier and Civil War. Scott gets arrested in Ant-Man 1 and spends Ant-Man 2 under house arrest. The Guardians all get arrested in First Bond during a space jail prison break. And Thor gets arrested by S.H.I.E.L.D. in Thor 1. Loki is in Asgard jail in Thor 2. And Thor is imprisoned by the Grandmaster in Ragnarok. Also, Captain Marvel's villains all pretty much end up being space cops. So are the cops in Phase 4 unusual? Yeah, kind of. Phase 4 signals a departure, a departure that was started mostly by Steve and the Winter Soldier in Civil War. It used to be the case that the heroes could count on S.H.I.E.L.D. or other well-meaning government agents to keep them safe from the numerous laws they were breaking. But in Phase 4, not only was S.H.I.E.L.D. gone, the world governments were hostile. They constantly viewed what our heroes were doing as dangerous because our heroes could not be controlled. It was easy to see where Phases 1, 2, and 3 were going because the end game of assembling the Avengers always solved the big problem and nearly everyone wanted them to do that outside of a few flat screen TVs and this jabroni. But it was always understood that once we had enough Avengers working together, Loki or Ultron or Thanos would lose. When the good guys did their big long take action scene, the world was saved. But the people in power no longer believe that. The snap created chaos and characters like Hayward and Val and this government guy and damage control were able to take over. The world wanted order. But now the Avengers are back and ready to solve problems the way they did before the snap, but the powerful people don't want that. Metahumans are not potential allies, they are threats. Secretive nations cannot be diplomatically engaged, they need to be destabilized. And at a higher level, the larger forces in the universe have decided they don't need our heroes heroes either. When Thor goes to the gods for help with the god butcher, he's laughed off. They don't solve problems like that, they wait them out. The Celestials have decided Earth and everyone on it needs to be sacrificed for the good of the universe. Who cares about the Avengers that just saved half of the universe? All the ones on Earth need to go. The Illuminati keeps order in the multiverse by any means necessary. They even have Ultron drones that seemingly protect their world when they can't. And above them all, the TVA takes care of the rest, keeps the multiverse from getting out of hand. And when Loki threatens the organization, they immediately decide to exterminate it. And that's why Phase 4 doesn't have as much clear direction. There is not any authority in place that welcomes the Avengers. This world and universe and multiverse and all of reality is hostile, pushing our heroes apart. And that's why the only logical endpoint for this structure is a government sanctioned shot at a more controlled Avengers, a Thunderbolts, one that will inevitably crash and burn. Because unlike Coulson arresting Thor or the Nova Corps arresting the Guardians, Phase 4 police are just bad, unsubtle villains who use cruelty to impose their will upon well-intentioned heroes. It's hard to not imagine this as something to do with the growing, let's call it, skepticism towards law enforcement that's been cropping up all around the world, but especially in the US since the mid-2010s, and splitting over into all media. Andor is very much on the same page about occupying paramilitary forces and radicalization. So is The Matrix Resurrections, and Avatar 2 probably, and Dune, and I'm not saying Dune was written recently as a response to Black Lives Matter or something, I'm just saying there is an appetite for that kind of media now. So it is no surprise that Phase 4 is as anti cop as the MCU has ever been. So there you go. Action figures, metaphysical crises, wristlets, good dads, and cops. But there's one more thing that's new, one more defining characteristic of Phase 4. The single thing that connected almost every single movie and show together. One idea that they all share. And no, it's not trauma. I understand what people mean when they say that that's what Phase 4 is about, but I just don't think it's something that's really unique about this phase. Every phase of the MCU has been defined by trauma. Both Guardians movies are just about trauma. The third Iron Man movie is about Tony dealing with PTSD. Endgame is trauma. Thor 2 is trauma. Far From Home, Doctor Strange, everything Hulk does. It is all trauma. Almost all superhero media is motivated by trauma. Batman, Superman, Spider-Man, same goes for grief. I think there's something to be said for certain Phase 4 projects really focusing on grief, like WandaVision and Wakanda Forever, but I don't think it's a new thing. I think there's a case to be made for the idea of legacy being the big Phase 4 idea. Many established MCU characters pass the torch in one way or another. We basically have a brand new crop of replacement Avengers should Kang steal the originals. But I think there's something more interesting that connects everything. A directive. An idea at the heart of the phase creatively. It is best articulated in a line from Eternals. Jon Snow is talking to Cersei after learning she is an Eternal. She tells him he'd be a very cute giraffe. You forgot that line, here it is. 
It made a very cute giraffe. See? Anyway, Jon Snow asks a question. Why didn't you guys help fight Thanos? Or any war, all the other terrible things throughout history. Phase 4 was the phase where nearly every movie or show or special introduced a group of special people or places or concepts that have actually been here the whole time. Phase 4 was the phase of the retcon. Now some of these examples are more of your classic retcon than some others, but the idea of retroactive continuity, or something in a story being rewritten to a state of always having been that way, is everywhere in Phase 4. Characters, entire groups of people, and big universe-changing concepts are not only introduced, but the explanation is that they've always been in the background and we just didn't see them, regardless of how much sense that makes in practice. We're gonna go through every show and movie, starting at the beginning. In release order, WandaVision introduces us to witches and the broader concept of non comartagian magic. It is apparently a natural ability you can be born with and activate with trauma slash an infinity stone and develop through study. Apparently, there have been entire covens of witches throughout history, including the Salem witches, which, real quick, I get it. It's fun that America has a horror thing, but the whole Salem witch trials is based on the time a town decided to kill 20-ish women because they could read. It's pretty messed up that we turn it into TV shows where women are actually witches. I don't know. Not only were there witches, but WandaVision introduced us to S.W.O.R.D. Originally, I imagine the Sentient World's Observation and Response Department was more of a NASA, but was repurposed into the Sentient Weapon Observation and Response Department. It's unclear if they ever had that first acronym, but it would make sense since the focus of the organization changed from space exploration to monitoring superpowered people and robots and synthesoids. Like has been the case with a lot of these big Phase 4 ideas, Falcon and the Winter Soldier wasn't the most significant in the group. You have the Global Repatriation Council, but that hasn't always been around as much as become a powerful organization during this snip. The series does give us our first look at Madripoor, a pretty significant hive of scum and villainy from the comics where we can expect to meet characters like Viper and perhaps even Wolverine. We did walk by the sign for the Princess Bar, a Madripoor hangout that Wolverine eventually owned. The only other figure of note introduced into Fatwa's terrible acronym is the Power Broker. Apparently, Sharon Carter went on the run after Civil War and set up shop in Madripoor, working to recreate the Super Soldier Serum. She might be a big player in the future, and it is suggested at the end of the series that she's working with someone else, perhaps Hydra or the Evil Scrolls. Either way, she could be important, although I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see much of her going forward. Loki was a big one. Not only did we get introduced to the TVA, but in this show we meet their leader, He Who Remains. And he explains to us that there's always been a group of cops patrolling the timeline, sniffing out variants that may create branches in the universe. And why didn't he do anything about Thanos? Well, everything that has happened up until this point is supposed to happen. Even the snap. That was fine. And He Who Remains warned us of the next Thanos, Kang the Conqueror, who it seems, according to the Ant-Man trailers, has been working in the Quantum Realm this whole time. So that's an entire agency that exists so far outside of everything we know that the Infinity Stones don't even count for them. And then behind them is the multiverse, endless universes with their own heroes and stories that have been going on this whole time, which may facilitate some mergers in the near future, who knows? Black Widow is an interesting one because this movie is a prequel set between Civil War and Infinity War and feels like it probably should have come out in 2017, but Perlmutter sexism or contracts or whatever pushed it to 2020 and then 2021. And in the movie, we learn that Natasha has an entire secret family of super spies and super soldiers that are somewhere? And she never checked up on them or told anyone about them because... Sure, we learn in Hawkeye that Yelena got snapped, but why not call her for Infinity War? Yeah, going on Widow rescuing missions is important, but so is saving half of all life in the universe. But these guys have always been around, and they will continue to be around in Phase 5 as the stars of the Thunderbolts, sure. On top of that, there have been an entire team of Black Widows running around who are now free. Some are apparently cage fighting, others are saving other Black Widows, and besides Yelena, it doesn't seem like there are many people who know how to find them, so... Yeah, she'll probably call him up in the future. Back to the multiverses. Only a few months after learning that the multiverse was in play, we were introduced to the Watcher, some sort of cosmic super being who watches all of reality and has always been doing that for all of time because it's his job. And he doesn't interfere, not for Thanos, not for the apparent incursion we learn about in Multiverse of Madness. I'm going to use the word apparently a lot. And you may be thinking, wait, we knew about the multiverse for years. Spider-Man Far From Home had a character basically explain it to us. Yeah, but he was lying, so I'm not counting it. Also, Amon Vellani, I am with you that this universe should be called Earth-19999. However, 
I'm willing to go with the 616 thing, even though Mysterio made it up, because years earlier, Selvig figured out 616 was something. He writes it on the board in the institution during his breakdown in Thor 2. So I'm working under the assumption that between Thor 2 and Far From Home, Selvig published a paper about the multiverse with the number 616 in it, and back or more likely his writer, Kuderman, found that and used it to create the story of Mysterio. So if that's the case, it makes sense that Mysterio has the right number. Let's take a break from the multiverse for a second. In Shang-Chi, we learn that the Mandarin, the seemingly fictional terrorist that Trevor Slattery was portraying as part of Aldrich Killian's scheme to kidnap the president with the help of the vice president, boy, Iron Man 3 really got away from him in the end. Anyway, that this Mandarin guy who led the Ten Rings was actually real. After Iron Man 3, I don't honestly know what I thought the Ten Rings was. They were an actual terrorist organization that was hired to kidnap Tony as part of Stane's plan to take over Stark Industries, and then a Ten Rings agent gave Vanko his passport. But then we learn that the organization's figurehead, the Mandarin, is an actor. And this is news to everyone, including the president. So it kind of seemed like Killian took an existing leaderless terrorist organization and co-opted their messaging. But I guess the guys in Iron Man 1 were some sort of rogue faction since Wenwu probably wouldn't let them do that. And then when it comes to Iron Man 3, I guess at the time Wenwu didn't really care or notice until it was all done. Or maybe he just assumed no one would be dumb enough to fall for it. So then Wenwu captures Trevor and we learn that the Mandarin has been a warlord working primarily out of China for thousands of years. One who invaded cities and single-handedly took down entire armies. One who also goes and beats up mobsters from time to time. One who at one point, I'd like to believe, went to a Toys R Us and bought a PlayStation 2 and DDR. Which means he bought a second gamepad because the game only comes with one. And nobody knew about this guy. The government never brings it up during Iron Man 3. And then sometime in the last 10 or 15 years, when Wu rebuilt his criminal organization from nothing and amassed a small army of henchmen, including a giant Romanian man with an arm sword. I think out of everyone who could have fought Thanos and helped, Wen Wu might have been our best bet. He didn't really have any good reason to stay out of the fight, and he would see Thanos as a threat to himself and his children. But because he was a secret, Wen Wu never really showed up until now. On top of that, we learn that there are apparently underground superhuman fighting rings operating out of Macau. They're combatants include a Black Widow, an extremist soldier, Abomination, who is more or less a good guy now and also green, and Wong, who is using this fight to train for his new role as Sorcerer Supreme. And on top of that, we learn there is apparently another dimension called Ta Lo that is only accessible through a portal in the middle of a Chinese bamboo forest. It has existed for thousands of years and can be reached by anyone provided they are a good driver and know the secret pathway. I imagine you can also fly over the forest and land in it since there does not appear to be a ceiling. The realm is filled with mythical creatures including a water dragon and is inhabited by a bunch of people. They're tasked with guarding a door to the imprisoned dweller in darkness and evil dragon who feeds on souls. The people of Talo seem to know about the rest of the world and at least one left Talo to live as part of our world. So all in one movie, we learn about a millennia old warlord an underground superhuman cage fighting ring, and a race of people from a different dimension populated with mythical creatures that have never come up before, but have been there the whole time. Next comes the Eternals. I'm not gonna go over how insane it is that these guys have been here the whole time just chilling, or the fact that apparently Batman and Superman are fictional characters in this universe. I do just want to point out that in Eternals, we learned that Druig was sort of an activist Eternal who grew tired of watching people suffer at the hands of warlords and enslavers. So we left the group to do something about that, and then he did nothing. We learned from Namor that the people of South and Central America were still invaded by the Conquistadors. So what did Druig do? It seems that Tenochtitlan was left alone and the armies of Cortes just gave up, but then I guess Spain sent new conquistadors to Yucatan some 50 years later, and by then Druig had gotten bored so he just let that one happen. I'd understand if Druig was not able to stop all of the genocides of the entire world, but this was one whole big campaign. Why did he not continue to have an effect on this region? And that's sort of where the retcon seems begin to show in Phase 4. All of these secret people and empires and agencies have been around for thousands of years, but none have had any impact. When they eventually show up, no one can have seen or heard of them before. They haven't done anything. Even Eternals seem to have both been the inspiration for figures like Gilgamesh and Icarus, but also exist alongside actual Greek gods that hang out and do orgies in space. I guess the strange part is that the Eternals aren't like what happened to the Roanoke colony. Like, Druig didn't uproot them all for some reason, and we just never knew what happened. He interfered in a real event that seems to have still occurred in-universe. Say what you will about Magneto being involved in the Kennedy assassination. 
Insane is a marketing thing, but at least it sort of makes sense. This would be like if Druig stopped Lee Harvey Oswald just as he was about to shoot Kennedy, but in Hawkeye we hear that JFK was still shot that day in Dealey Plaza. The Eternals and the Mandarin and the Black Widows have always been in the background affecting history, yet left no mark. Hawkeye was pretty light on retcons. We learn about Kingpin being a crime boss, but we've never really gotten into the New York mob scene, so he might as well be a new character. It's also revealed that Clint's wife, Laura, was a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent as well, and she had the same identifying number as Mockingbird, which makes sense since in the comics, Mockingbird and Hawkeye were married. We've never had any indication before that Laura was any sort of superhero or anything. Some would say part of the charm of Hawkeye's secret family was how normal they were, but not anymore. She was always a secret agent the whole time, and we never heard about it. It's only a matter of time until Tony's proven right and the kids were agents the whole time too. Spider-Man was our third look at the multiverse in this phase. We learned that certain spells can unlock the multiverse and if done wrong can bring certain people to the wrong universe. I do think this is the flip side about how Phase 4 handles history and myths when it comes to retcons. What they've been able to do with the multiverse is genuinely impressive. Over the course of four projects, we learned so much about how the multiverse works and it all more or less fits together. Random variations in the timeline create branches. Those branches lead to different but sometimes similar alternate realities. The multiverse is the totality of all of those realities existing alongside each other. Sometimes people from one universe can cross over into another, and that usually leads to a catastrophe. And if too much crossover occurs, that can create an incursion, which can destroy one or both realities. And we learn that back in the day, one person waged war against all of his multiversal selves and nearly destroyed everything. But one of those multiversal selves purged all versions of himself from the timeline, controlling the growth of the multiverse. He's dead now, so the multiverse can continue to grow, and that person can exist again and create another multiverse. Universal War. And No Way Home was also the first time we were actually introduced to characters from alternate movie universes in the Spider-Man and their villains. Sure, Pietro showed up in WandaVision, but that wasn't the real Pietro. It was just, um, I'm still not sure what the explanation for why he looks exactly like another Pietro is. I don't know. But these other movie universes, in this case the Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield Spider-Man universes, have always existed alongside the MCU and will now cross over. This is also where the MCU introduced us to Venom and more importantly the symbiote. Now it didn't do anything important in this movie besides get drunk, but it does apparently exist in the MCU now since some of it was left in that bar. More on that later. Moon Knight, like Hawkeye, was pretty self-contained. We met some new gods who don't seem to have anything to do with the other gods of Love and Thunder, but it makes enough sense. The Egyptian gods and the Greek gods of the MCU are both sort of messes, so one may not want to spend time with the other. This is the second version of the afterlife we've been introduced to in the MCU, and it won't be the last. Seems like pretty much all of them exist, except for the one Gore wants to go to. His promised version of the afterlife is alive for some reason. As expected, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness was the other expositional goldmine for Phase 4. Besides expanding on the existence of witchcraft and giant tentacle monsters, we also get a better look at the multiverse. Again, characters from other movie universes who have always existed have now used the multiverse to enter the MCU. Professor Xavier and presumably his version of the X-Men kind of exist. People have theorized that this is the good Days of Future Past timeline, and I don't hate that idea. It could be the animated series universe since that's what the chair looks like, but I just don't think a lot of those details add up. We know what that Mr. Fantastic looks like from the Secret Wars crossover, and this doesn't seem to be him. That universe also had a Miss Marvel that was Carol Danvers and a Captain America that was Steve Rogers. It isn't out of the question, but it's probably not the animated series universe. But on top of that, and go with me here, since the Captain Marvel story played out about the same way as it did in Earth 616 with the small change that Maria got the powers instead of Carol, and since her costume and powers suggest that the Kree of that universe is similar to the Kree of the MCU, and since the Kree Empire canonically created the Inhumans, I think it's reasonable to assume that the MCU also has Inhumans that have been hiding this whole time. And that's sort of what they do in the comics and in their show that doesn't exist, so it fits. Miss Marvel introduced us to another group, like the people of Talo, in the clandestine. They have their own dimension, called the Nor Dimension, that they're locked out of and have been living on Earth in secret for centuries, trying to find the bangle they need to open the door to their home. Unlike the Eternals, they didn't get positions of power and shape world events, they just sort of looked around and waited until someone found the bangle. But they have been secretly existing in the background and never really doing anything. Miss Marvel also gave us a better look at damage control, which we've seen previously in Spider-Man's Homecoming and No Way Home. 
They're a government agency that both cleans up after superhuman disasters, but apparently now works proactively to prevent them. And I assume they've been doing this since Homecoming? But more surprisingly importantly, Miss Marvel also introduced us to the concept of mutants, one which Black Panther would later clarify. Apparently, there have always been mutants living on Earth and no one has been looking for them. Maybe that means the X-Men are just hiding here too? But it doesn't seem like this is going to be what some people expected to happen, where some big event would cause the mutations to start. They've been going on the whole time, just no one knew where to look. Now traditionally Miss Marvel is not a mutant but an inhuman and I'm honestly 50-50 on the change. On one hand her connection to the inhumans is tenuous at best. She's not part of the royal family and considers herself a new human. On the other hand, I like that, like Spider-Man or Daredevil who totally could have been mutants but just aren't. Miss Marvel is her own thing, separate from the mutant drama that's usually the purview of the X-Men. I don't know, I could be swayed one way or the other. But besides being introduced to organizations that have been here the whole time like the Clandestine and Damage Control and the Red Dagger Society, which is apparently like two guys, Miss Marvel also introduced us to the apparently long-running concept of mutants. Thor Love and Thunder formalized the concept of gods in the MCU while also making it somehow less clear. They all exist and have existed this whole time, and some answer prayers, and some choose not to because they're lazy. They're all led by Zeus, who's the first god who has been around for thousands of years, whatever you say, but they don't really do much, and I'm just so confused. Like, what makes Thor or Jane a god as opposed to just an alien? Could Captain Marvel be a god if people start worshipping her? Or Groot? Why not? But Thor Love and Thunder also introduced us to the concept of Eternity, one of the cosmic entities. Entities. They exist above pretty much everything else in comics. I don't know exactly where they rank next to the Celestials, but since Galactus is a cosmic entity and he is more powerful than a Celestial, I imagine that means the rest of the cosmic entities are about as powerful. This group includes beings like Infinity, Death, and the Living Tribunal, who we briefly see in Doctor Strange 2 during the multiverse scene. Apparently, Eternity allows you to make a wish and everyone has known this exists and you need Thor's new hammer to access it and they've just all been sitting on this information the entire time. On top of that, Love and Thunder may have given us another in route to the symbiotes since All Black the Necrosword is usually a symbiote, which makes sense. It has that same sort of design in the comics, lots of spiky black tendrils. So the symbiotes and presumably Null their god have also existed in the MCU for as long as the Necrosword has. Oh boy, where do we begin with She-Hulk? We've got mutants like El Aguilar and Mr. Immortal. We've got other enhanced people like Titania or Banbol. We've got our first vampire, probably. We also have the introduction of a superhuman tailor who has made costumes for all of the heroes in this universe, like um, I guess all the ones that didn't get costumes from Iron Man or the military or just make them themselves. I don't know who that is. But She-Hulk's big retcon was Daredevil. Now Matt says he's been at this hero thing for a while. I would assume that means in Hell's Kitchen in New York City. However, even though he's been around this whole time, he's never come up before. Not during Civil War or any of the Spider-Man stories that take place in New York or even the end of Falcon and the Winter Soldier. However, that makes more sense since the UN building is all the way across town. The reason I find it odd is that in the show, Matt is surprised that Jen doesn't know he exists. So as far as Matt is concerned, Daredevil is a public figure who has been daredeviling around New York for, I guess, a decade? Even though there are not that many super people around, no one has ever mentioned him, not even when comparing him to, I don't know, another red and black suited New Yorker who swings around with a super sense. She-Hulk also introduced us to Scar, the son of the Hulk from the planet Sakaar. Now he looks to be around 15 years old and I'm sure the explanation will be he just ages quicker. Or as will probably be the case with a certain other retcon child, maybe Kang shot him with the time gun. Either way, Scar comes out of nowhere. And obviously She-Hulk breaking the fourth wall is pretty significant, but as far as I'm concerned that moment occurs outside of continuity, so there is no con to ret. Marvel's first special presentation introduced us to Werewolf by Night and a handful of other monster hunters because apparently monsters exist too. Werewolves, zombies, I'm guessing chupacabras and the Jersey Devil, they're all real things that are hunted by a family of monster hunters who have, say it with me, been around for hundreds of years but until now haven't really done anything significant. We are also introduced to Man-Thing, a character who, if MCU history is in line with the comics, was part of yet another attempt to create the super soldier serum like Luke Cage, Isaiah Bradley, and eventually Wolverine. Oh right, She-Hulk already suggested Wolverine exists in the MCU. 
cool. Black Panther Wakanda Forever is the perfect movie to bring all this together. For the last 500 years, there has apparently been an entire civilization of underwater fish people living somewhere off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula. They've never interfered before now, but because of the invention of a vibranium detector, their existence is threatened. So we are learning about them for the first time. They're led by Namor, who is also apparently the first mutant. So mutants have been a part of the MCU for at least 500 years. On top of that, spoilers, the movie ends with the revelation that T'Challa and Nakia had a son at least five years ago that she has been raising secretly. She never told Shuri, T'Challa's sister, about it, and we find out in a post credit scene. So not only is there a new Black Panther in Shuri, there has apparently been a secret T'Challa son for five years that we just never heard about. And I don't know if we're counting the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special as Phase 4, but if we are, it ends with a pretty significant retcon too. And based on my reaction to some of those choices, you may get the idea that I'm against all of these retcons, and that is not the case. In fact, I think it makes a lot of sense. I think about it like it's sports, it doesn't matter which one, but each phase is a season and every season is made of movies and shows that lead to the playoffs, that's your Avengers movie. Every season, your goal is to make the playoffs and win. And nearly every season, the MCU has done great. I would say Avengers 1 was winning the championship. Age of Ultron, getting to the semifinals. And Infinity War and Endgame together was the movie equivalent of winning the championship and breaking the home run record in the same game. But for Phase 3, the last game was also when a lot of our veteran players retired. They wanted to go out on a high note, and they did. But then the question was, okay, well, what comes next? What's the upcoming season going to look like for this team without most of its big stars? We're in what you call a rebuilding year. Your veteran players retired or got traded, and you need to figure out what the future is for this team. And I'm not saying that phase four is the equivalent of throwing to get a better draft pick, but this is about developing talent setting up new players from new places and working on building the team out. You know you're not getting to the playoffs this year, so the goal is not to get another Avengers movie. The goal is to see who's got what it takes to get you there next season. Figure out some plays, character combinations that'll make phases 5 and 6 shine. Figure out who needs work, which characters or teams might not be ready for prime time, and which ones surprised everyone and deserve more attention. After I wrote this video, I watched a video from a channel called Pillar of Garbage, very cool channel, check them out, with a similar theme who came to a similar conclusion, although he described it as expansion, which, you know, in hindsight is probably a better word, but it's the same idea. Marvel has some time to relax and develop new talent before Kang Dynasty and Secret Wars, so they're messing around with the world a bit, figuring out how to fit the multiverse and the Netflix characters and Deadpool and whoever else they think makes sense in this universe together. But they do it now, in phase four. Set the table so that in phases five and six, we can go crazy. Take all of these disparate ideas and characters and smash them all together. By the way, Kevin, I know phase five is coming up soon, and if you need some help organizing your world building, I would love to introduce you to this video sponsor, World Anvil. World Anvil is so cool. It's an award-winning tool used by millions of world builders, writers, and gamers that can help you create, store, and organize your world setting. So like, say you're a game master and you're working on an RPG and you wanna keep track of everything in your world, like the factions and the timelines, the geography, the family trees, World Anvil has all of that. Everything you need to stay organized. There are interactive maps and character profiles that you can share with your players, complete with their own themes to match your story. But what if you're just a writer, like working on a screenplay, or a novel, or a fanfic, or, I don't know, a spec script for a Great Lake Avenger show? Well, World Anvil can do that too. They have tools that help you work with other writers, including a linkable freeform whiteboard feature that I have used and love. And if you know me, you know. I am very discerning when it comes to my whiteboards, but this thing is so cool, it makes organizing ideas and figuring out the flow of a story so simple. So, if you wanna be able to create, store, and organize all of the cool elements of your RPG, novel, video game, whatever you're making, you can check out World Anvil right now, absolutely free. And you can receive 40% off any annual membership by using the code NANDO. Then not only will you be able to make awesome worlds and stories, but you will also be helping out the channel in the process, which I appreciate so much. Once again, that's code NANDO for 40% off any annual membership, and thank you so much for your support. As always, I'm going to give a huge thank you to everybody that supports the channel on Patreon, everybody that listens to my podcast, mostly nitpicking, everybody that watches these videos early on Nebula, and everybody that follows me on Twitter and Twitch. My name is Nando V Movies on all of those platforms. That's all I've got. Stay safe. I'll see you soon.